So just welcome to you all. I'm going to hand you over to Carl and obviously to Alex. But um, on behalf of us all, I just want to thank Alex very much for stepping up. He hasn't got a clue what he's doing coming in front of us. Um, but you'll find out in a minute when the questions start firing. So uh, over to you both. Cool. Right. So um, originally, Alan asked me to do this workshop, but um, I, I, I soon realised I've been a little bit out of my depth because I've been taught a lot by Alex, but if you guys start asking me questions, um, it would soon um, soon go all wrong. Um, so what we've done instead, I've asked Alex from Depict um, Videography to um, come over and um, show us how to edit in DaVinci uh, Resolve. Um, it's software which I use and Alex is an accredited trainer for now as well. He's a video maker in his, or filmmaker, sorry, Alex, filmmaker in his own right. And <laughs> it's whatever we get called these days, I'm happy to take it. That's it. And so he's been using this software um, for, for a long, long time now. So I'll hand you over to Alex a little bit, but he's prepared a, um, a short video of the edit. So that should play through without any technical difficulties. Then after the video is finished, um, Alex will go into a Q&A session. So I'll let Alex uh, take over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everybody, for having me. It's really great to be able to come along and have a chat. And as Carl said, I'm a videographer. I actually have transitioned a little bit away from production recently, and we've gone more into the training and consultation side of video production and helping people who run their own businesses, you know, small, medium enterprises, basically, to start doing more with video. And that's largely been as a result of um, lockdown and pandemics and things like that. Instead, if my background changes and I go a weird colour, just carry on and try and ignore it, because my camera's doing a very odd thing. It's a rubbish web camera but it's um i've got a green screen behind me and it's trying to do sort of funny things so i might go pink later on so look out for that if that happens um but yeah i've got a short video just to play it's i say short it's um 20 minutes or so just a quick tutorial run through of a breakdown that we did of carl's um piece that he sent me so carl basically wanted to do a little video and i've got an edit to show you as well so we'll load that up in just a sec but i'll show you the that will be the finished edit of how to just sort of go through and do an edit in DaVinci Resolve. As Carl said, I'm an accredited trainer for DaVinci Resolve. It's made by a company called Blackmagic Design. I'll tell you a bit more about that in the video itself, but it's a fantastic platform. It's completely free. Uh, they have a studio version, which is still only 235 pounds. So it's really very affordable and it's used in Hollywood. So it's, the great thing about it is it's something that you can start with and learn slowly and then you don't have to sort of then start to relearn another application because you've run out of room or feature set with the one that you're using and it works on Mac and PC. So it's really very powerful indeed. So let me do a screen share and then we'll get that going. And we'll, if you hold on to questions and I'll come back to those at the end. Okay. Probably best all mute as well, I think. Yeah. Okay. Can everyone, everyone hear that? Let's have a look. Let me just screen the sh screen share. Hopefully it'd be that. So you should see my screen now and we'll play that for you now. Hi there guys, and thanks ever so much for having me along to talk about video editing inside of DaVinci Resolve 17. My name is Alex Cameron. I'm a certified DaVinci Resolve trainer and Carl suggested it would be a good idea for me to walk you through a very quick process of getting the footage into DaVinci Resolve, editing it and adding some simple titles and things and then rendering it out. So I'm gonna focus my attention on doing that today. The program itself is pretty big. There's a lot going on and I will give you a very brief overview as we're going along, but there's a lot more to it and obviously we could go into way more detail, but let's focus on the main task at hand. When you first open DaVinci Resolve, you're gonna be greeted by the project manager. If it's the very first time you're installing it, you might well get a little walkthrough screen that shows you how to set some things up. But for the most part, this is where you're gonna launch into DaVinci Resolve when you very first get started. The great thing about DaVinci Resolve is it's absolutely free. They have a free version and a studio version. The studio version is what we're gonna be using today, but for the most part, it's gonna be exactly the same as the free version for you. The free version doesn't really hold an awful lot back. So definitely go and get that from the Blackmagic Design website. You can download it today. Uh, the version 17 is currently on beta nine because they've only just announced it and released it. So it's very stable though. So I'd have no hesitations to using it. It's also Mac and PC friendly. So great stuff, crack on and enjoy this wonderful bit of software. So when you load into the project manager for the first place, this is where all your projects are gonna live. and by default, it always gives you an untitled project, and then obviously any other projects you're working on would be shown here as well. We're just gonna jump straight into this untitled project, either by double-clicking it or by pressing the open button down here. 
when you launch into DaVinci Resolve for the very first time, you will see this cut page interface here, which is the one we're actually gonna be working in today primarily. They have a number of rooms across the bottom of the application here, and that's the media room. This is where you're gonna ingest media, organize it, get it ready for the edit. The cut page, which is a fast interface, it's very simple, does basic editing tasks. It's a great place to either compile all your old footage, get it onto a timeline, reorder it if you're doing a bigger edit, or simply do a very fast, quick turnaround edit. The edit page is more advanced. It's much more familiar if you're coming from something like Premiere Pro, so another non-linear editing platform, or again, Final Cut. It may even feel familiar if you're used to the old Final Cut. Fusion is where we're doing VFX, green screen compositing, all sorts of advanced titles, things like that. And again, we're not going to touch that today. It's a huge application in its own right. Color, this is really where DaVinci Resolve was made. It was built around its color page. It's used in Hollywood today for finishing some really high-end films. And again, anything to do with coloring, finishing, you're gonna do that inside of the color page. The Fairlight page is where we can mix audio and it's incredibly powerful. Again, a lot of the audio tools you'll need on a daily basis are gonna be fine in the cut and edit pages. And then we have the deliver page, which is essentially where we're gonna decide how we export our footage to the web or social media or your YouTube channels and things like that. There's a simplistic version of it in the cut page and that's why I want to start there. So jumping back to the cut page, let's have a look at what we've got here. Main areas we're gonna be working, the media pool, the viewers, and then the timeline area down here. The timeline area is pretty unique and I'll show you that in just a second. So let's get some media straight into our project to begin with working on it. Now we have no clips in the media pool and the media pool, think of that as just really a house for all of your assets, your video clips, your graphics, your logos, text, all sorts of stuff is gonna live in the media pool. So we need to bring some things in. So you can do it a number of different ways. You can either go file, import, import media, you can right click, you can import media this way, you can simply grab a folder and drag media in, or the way I like to do it, and if you, in this case, if you look at this, I've already got my media sorted into graphics and then video clips, and these are ones that Carl's kind of given us, but I want to keep those graphics and video folders or bins organized. So in this case, rather than do it this way, I'm just going to use this one here, which is a option when it allows you to import a project media folder. So I'm gonna click that, and I'm gonna choose, go back one, I'm gonna choose this media, and I'm gonna go open. And it's ask, gonna ask me about the project frame rate. So the project frame rate, essentially, what we want to try and do is have the project frame rate matching our clip frame rate. Generally speaking, great rule of thumb to try and do that. So if you shot in 25 frames per second, you want to edit in 25 frames per second. In this case, actually, we've got some high frame rate footage that Carl sent us. I'm just going to change the frame rate to match. So in this case, I'm going to hit change and allow the system to do that bit for me. And that way I haven't got to dive into the project settings, which are located down here in the bottom right hand side. And then you can see the project settings. And that's actually been updated for us here, the timeline frame rate and the playback frame rate. It is important to do that at the beginning, so it's well worth just letting the system do it for you in this case. And I'm gonna navigate into my bin and I can see I've got some media here. And if I scrub through, I can sort of see it moving, which is great just by hovering over with the mouse. If I want to load it into my viewer, I can simply double click it. And what you'll see here is that I get the source clip jump up here and I can see my clip there. And I've got an audio waveform along the bottom and I've got a playhead, which I can scrub through by clicking and dragging. Now, what I want to do is I want to find out what part of this clip I want to load into my timeline. So in this case, I want to mark an in and out range. So to do that, I'm going to find the bit. And this bit here, I know Carl's just talking, and I'm going to just turn my media audio off. And he's just talking, telling us about what we're going to do here. So let me just cut that back to here. And I'm going to mark in in with an I key. And then at the end, he finishes talking, and I'm going to leave it there. So actually, I'm going to leave it there. In this case, press the O key to mark an out and I've got an in and an out. I could have easily dragged these handles as well. And when I do drag the handles, I get a new trim viewer showing up as well. So I can be very precise. And you can see the in point on the left and the out point on the right. So maybe, maybe there. Once I'm set, I can just simply back up out of there. I'm happy, I can add this to my timeline. The easiest way of doing that, dragging it down and letting go. So once we're now in the timeline view, you can see that we've got two different timelines going on here. We've got the top timeline, which is actually showing us our full timeline zoomed out all the way. So it always will dynamically zoom to show us our entire project from the very start to the very finish. And then the bottom timeline is a zoomed in detailed timeline, which allows us to be more finesseful over certain trims or edits that we're doing, which is really great because you can very quickly navigate 
through all of your shots, all of your media in one go. And this is even more powerful when you've got lots of shots on the timeline. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna have a little look through this footage and I'm gonna work out where I need to make some cuts. So let me just have a little look through. I'm gonna turn my audio back on. Right, okay, so sometimes when we make a video, uh, we, uh, we record the audio on a separate device. Um, I'm not doing that today, um, but it's always good practice to um, do a loud clap before you start to, um, to film, because that way you can sync your video um, with that. So we're gonna do a loud clap and then we'll start the video. So basically, this is just a little bit of the beginning video that we're going to chop off probably because Carl was just telling you a little bit about how we would sync audio in if you had a separate audio file being recorded elsewhere, not actually within the camera. And obviously, you can see a bit like a Hollywood technique here. You get this nice, strong waveform spike, and then you get the visual on the camera, and you would simply use the two audio waveforms, and you'd line them up in the timeline area so that you had a perfect sync. Something that helps you do that, incidentally, I'm going to turn it on right away, is this audio trim option here. Because when we now start to trim our media, what happens is when I trim this media, you'll notice that we get a nice full audio waveform, which is really useful for us. Because when we're trimming, we can now work it through. Let's find that clap. There we go. And we've just trimmed to that clap. It's very, very easy to do when you've got this audio trim turned on. We've also got snapping turned on. This is going to help us magnetize our playhead and it's going to snap to the front of each clip or edit point as we move through. Sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. If you need to turn it off, you simply toggle it on and off there. So let's move through from here. Right. So the first thing we want... And I think this is where the video starts, where he says the first thing. So let's go back. There we go. This is really the start of the video talking about video editing. So I'm going to use the cursor to come across here. You notice I get a different cursor depending on where my placement of my cursor is. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. But for now, what I want to do is grab the front end of this clip and I simply want to then trim it back to where my playhead is. So, Like so. That's really straightforward and very easy to do. And then we're in the right place to start editing. The first thing we want to add to this video is my logo. So we're going to add that just here. So now Carl's asking us to put a logo in. We can absolutely do that. We just simply found our media folder, find the logo that he'd like to bring in, and we can grab that and drag it down onto our timeline and let go. Obviously, it's a little bit big, so we're going to need to resize it. So let's just do that now. All I'm going to do is select it, come up to the top right corner, press the inspector, and I have my inspector. I've got a whole load of different things I can do. Zoom is scale, so in this case, we're going to scale it back. I'm going to reposition it. I'm going to find a nice spot for it there. Probably a bit more, maybe something like that. Put it up in the top corner. Very good. Obviously, if you wanted to make it a bit more like a watermark, you could come down to the composite. You could change the opacity. You could do all sorts of things there. For the time being, let's just leave it like that. Now, obviously, we've only got a default length on the timeline here, so it only lasts for a few seconds and then it disappears. What we'd like to do is drag it out for the entire duration. This is where the two timelines really helps us because we don't need to zoom out all the way to suddenly extend this all the way to the end. We simply grab the top timeline, grab the end, if I can get my hand on it, there we go, and drag it out. And we know that the end of the project is here. So we can easily move our timeline all the way to the end very quickly. And now we've got that running through all the way through our edit, which is great. So let's keep going. Great. So I hope that looks nice and good. We've got the branding uh, just right. We can also add titles as well. So we can add titles anywhere on the screen, but it may be nice to see a title on the bottom just here. So now we're going to have a little title added in here. So to do that, we've got transitions, titles, and effect panels up here if we want to look through them. Transitions are obviously ways that we can use to transition certain things onto the screen. Titles, obviously, we're going to come back to. And effects is how we could do things like CCTV effects or binoculars or all sorts of fun stuff. But for the time being, let's come back to titles. DaVinci Resolve 17 has updated the way this works a little bit because now you can actually hover scrub over these and get an appreciation of what these are going to look like. What's really cool, you've got two main areas. You've got the main basic titles and then you've got fusion titles. Fusion titles are essentially just something that was created in Fusion as a template for you. And normally it creates a little bit of an animation and there's different ones depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. So there's a whole load of different things that you can do here. For the time being, let's use the basic text tool to add a title. I'm gonna just drag it on. I can add it to either timeline. 
and you see how that shows up now. And we've got the basic title on the screen. I just need to select it. And in the inspector, I have some settings, two main tabs to worry about, the main title and then the settings. So let's go into title and change it. There we go. And I can change the font very nicely here as well. So let's find a nice font that we like. And I want to reposition it slightly. So let's move it down. Let's size it up. And you can have all sorts of fun with that. By default, you've got drop shadow stroke and background already turned on, but there's nothing actually showing because we haven't changed any of these parameters. You can easily toggle them on and off, but we want to add a background to this one. So in which case, I'm just going to change the height and you'll see it shows up, stretch it out all the way. And I'm going to change the opacity as well so that we've got a semi transparency there. Not too much, but just mostly. There we go. Perfect. And I'm actually going to now change that a little bit by just dragging it down a tiny bit more. So it meets the bottom. There we go. Perfect. So we've got our nice title on. But of course, again, it's only on for a default length of time. You can change your defaults up in the preferences. But for now, we're just going to simply use the drag out. And we're going to drag it out. And in which case, I'm just going to drag it out a wee way, probably to, to probably say about here for the time being. Let's have a look through. Yeah. Just here. Now, of course, if we wanted to add a transition, as I said to you before, let's come to a transition and we could have a way of these titles transitioning onto the screen. So let's have a look. Let's say I wanted it to do a cross iris. I could just use that. And you could see how that's going to unfold. And actually, let's use that in this case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click it. And you notice this little white arrow. This is indicating the smart insert point. And this insert point tells us where we're going to be adding that if we did a double click. If I just undo that for a second, I could also just drag it down and let it go on the part of the edit point that I want it to go down to. So now let's watch through and see what this looks like. Yeah. Perfect. So there we go. Very nice and very easy. I could also send change that at any point if I wanted to. I could do a push. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. I could have it do all sorts of things. In fact, that push as well, I could push left, but I can also push up. And in this case, I think I'll have something like that. Awesome, just here. Perfect. Happy with that title. I'm going to leave it be from there. Let's play through. By the way, just to play through, I'm pressing the space bar, but you can also press the J, K, and L keys. The L key pushes you forward. The K key stops, and the J key gets you going backwards. You've also got transport controls underneath here for play, stop, play backwards, stop. So. Either way, you're covered. Let's just play through. Good. That's good. Do you like the titles? Something else we can do is like sometimes when I'm talking to ca camera like this, we can make some blah, 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 blah. Well, it's very easy to cut that out. So we're cutting that bit out and we start again. Great. So you like the title. So you see what Carl's done there. He's gone wrong and we need to chop that bit out. And he's obviously gone and started back from a bit where he knew he was good. And that's just helpful because that gives us a lead into this next section. So I know that I want to sort of pick it up about here, probably about here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this bottom clip. OK, so to do that, it's quite simple. Select the clip, right click and then split. If I undo that for a second, you could also just click with the right mouse button on the top of the playhead. And then there's a pair of scissors. Click that and that will also split. If you haven't selected anything, it will just split everything underneath the playhead. So we've got the end point marked out. So let's go back to the bit where he, before he makes the mistake, and he's talking about his titles. Do you like the titles? So, so probably here, I'm going to cut again. So I'm going to use the same technique. And I've now got, if you come up in the top, you can see there I didn't select anything, and so it split everything. Now, I don't actually want to do that. So let me just go back. I'm going to undo. I'm going to select the bottom clip, right click, scissors. And again, this time you can see now we've got this little clip in the middle that we actually want to get rid of. So we can very easily do that by just pressing the backspace key. Now, normally video track one is supposed to ripple, but in this instance, because we've got some other things going on already, there's no rippling happening. And this is just simply a gap, but it's actually a gap that we can select and further delete if we want to by pressing the delete key. And you'll notice how that now rippled up to close the gap. And that's exactly what we want to do. So in this case, we're going to go from here now. to there. Now, there's a little trim required here because there's too much of a breath. So I'm just going to grab the right part of this edit point. So the edit point is where the two clips touch. You'll notice that as I select each side, I'm affecting different parts of this edit point. You'll also notice how my viewer has changed to give me a trimming viewer. And what this is showing me is the outgoing part of the edit point here, the incoming point of the edit point there. And I've got these two areas that I can change either the incoming, so the left-hand side, 
or the so the outgoing on the left-hand side or the incoming on the right-hand side. And I can either do that here or I can do it down here. Easy peasy, no problem. Obviously this side, I'm gonna be affecting the left-hand side. This side, you can see it's selected just slightly on the left, on the right, sorry, it's selecting the other side. And then in the middle, it's a roll. So actually that way I actually move it and you can see how that's rolling back and forth. Let me just change that. And in this case, I just want to trim off this little breathy bit at the front of this part of the trip clip. Again, you can see how easy that is to do, especially when you've now got this audio trim feature turned on. And let's just have a look at how that looks. Now, now obviously there's a bit of a jump cut there and we could fix this a number of different ways. For me, the easiest way to fix this on this case is just to simply select the bottom clip, come up to the inspector and we do a slight zoom in and we do a slight reposition, I'm trying to keep the eye line roughly level. I'm also gonna stop my titles at this point. So I'm just gonna grab the titles and you notice how I can do it in the top viewer as well. Snap that back to that cut, and then you see how this looks. Titles. Now we can also. So it just helps remove the jarring effect a little bit. Something called rolling titles as well, so we get this title scrolling up the screen. So we've had some of those. So as Carl turns here, he's going to have some scrolling titles. So as he starts to turn, I'm going to make my cut again. So again, selecting the clip, right clicking, split the clip. Now what I'm going to do is just use this sort of remaining part of the clip, and I'm going to zoom back out of it and go back to the original dimensions. And to do that, I simply come up here to the transform controls in the inspector. And then you've got all of these different reset options. I'm just gonna reset everything so it goes back to its default. And you'll notice here, it now does Scrolling that. Zoom. Screen. So we've had some of those. And then as he asks for the, as he wants the scrolling text to come up, we're gonna do that. So we're now gonna look at a different type of title, which is just the scrolling text. And the good thing is there's a preset here. You could use your basic text and then simply set keyframes. But again, why go to all that trouble when you can just add some scrolling text? Now, obviously at the moment you don't see anything because of course it's designed to scroll on. So let's just go to the middle and then we'll change that and put some different text in here. There we go. So we've got some new text. We can obviously change all of the parameters of the text in here as well. So let's just do that. I'm going to find one that I like. I can change the size if I want to, however big or small I want it to be. Maybe about that sort of size is good. Let's change the color to black, I think in this case. And obviously it's on the wrong side. So let's move it over to the other side. We simply do that by using the alignment controls. And now what we want to do is get the settings right. So we're going to reposition it. Let's get it repositioned underneath. There we go, the logo there. And in fact, what I think it's, it's a little bit big, so let me just resize it again. Incidentally, you can just drag it either on the slider or actually on the number block. There we go, something like that is quite cool. Let's scale it right down. In fact, let's scale it up a bit more. Let's keep it, let's keep it big for the scaling, okay. Cool, so that's really good. So now what we'll see is it's actually gonna scroll all the way through. Perfect, it's a little bit fast. And now the length of this actual clip De determines the length of the, the scroll. So if I drag that out a little bit, and if I drag it out, I'm gonna drag it out until Carl's sort of happy that everything's happened and he's moving through. And you see how it slowed down. Perfect, that's great, but it also does overlap my portrait logo here. So what I want to do is get rid of that and have it stop just underneath the logo. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is open up the tools palette. By opening up the tools palette, I get the transform bounding box showing up here, which just makes this a little bit easier to see. There are some controls under here, but this is really a carryover from the old version of the software because they've now given you these inspector controls. So it makes it a little bit easier to do it in here. So I'm just gonna to jump to the settings tab and I'm just gonna change the Y position, making sure I can see that bounding box. And I'm just gonna have it end just underneath the logo like that. And now what we'll do is we turn the tool palette off, we'll come back and have a look. There we go. That's our scrolling titles. That's great. One final thing we're going to do, as I'm talking, we're going to add some B-roll. So maybe some other footage. So we're going to add that right now. So now we're going to add some other footage as Carl suggested. So back to our media pool, go back to our media and our video bin. We've got some other media here. If I double click it to load it in the viewer, I can now see, okay, so it's a nice shot of our frames in the studio. I'm going to mark the in with the I key. And I'm going to mark it out with the O key. I've now got a nice range and I want to bring that down onto the timeline. So I can either just drag it straight down or in this case, I've got some controls here to again, add things to the timeline. There's a great function here called place on top. If I just simply click that, it's just simply going to drop 
the clip exactly where I was on the playhead and then move the playhead to the end of the clip for me. Let me just move back and show you. And we're going to add that right now. So and then we typically add that B-roll on top while the narrative continues. So underneath. what you can see here is our lovely collection of frames that we do in the studio. And I'm just going to trim the, that back a little bit. So it ends here. I hope you like that. Now, one thing we can do, because this is nice, but it's a little bit unstable. So what you can see, there's also a problem because we've also brought this clip in and there is some associated audio, which is getting in the way and making it a little bit noisy. So I'm just going to right click on that clip and then come to mute to turn off the audio for that particular clip. And I'm also going to make sure it's selected. I'm going to come up to my inspector, stabilization and hit stabilize. And because this is a handheld shot, this is typically what this works best on. It will quickly analyze the clip. It might do a little punching of zoom. And then what it's going to do is analyze that and give us a nice smooth clip. So what you can see here is our lovely collection of frames that we do in the studio. I hope you like that. There we go. Makes that clip a little bit more bearable and not quite as shaky. And I'm just going to let that so play through. So that's it. That's how you edit the video. Hope you enjoyed it. So there's the end of our video. So what I actually want to do now is just trim off these final little bits. I'm going to trim off this one again because it extends all the way off here. I can simply grab it in the top timeline, drag it back, snap it to it, let it go. And we've got our edit. It's all done and ready to go. Now I'm going to turn off the inspector. And of course, you could now jump straight to the deliver page and go to deliver. But I appreciate this could look a little bit cumbersome and all these settings here might be a little bit overwhelming. Great thing is in the cut page, you've got that covered easily with the quick export panel. Simply click the quick export panel and you've got some very popular exporting options. For the most part, H.264 is absolutely ideal for web streaming or anything like that. So social media, YouTube, things like that. No problem. It gives you a little bit of information about the clip and the rendering settings that it's going to be using. If you wanted, you can actually go to YouTube and it's the same H.264 setting, but this gives you the option to upload directly to your YouTube channel, which is really very nice indeed. But for the time being, let's just do an H.264 export and we're going to hit export. It will then ask us for a name and someone to go. So let's go to the desktop for the time being and Carl edit. Perfect. And we're going to hit save. That will now open up the render panel and just show you that it's rendering out. It's giving you the time remaining. It's perfect time to go get a cup of tea. And then when you're coming back, you're going to have a perfectly ready clip to go out onto your social media channels, YouTube and the likes. I hope that was really useful. I hope that gave you a really quick insight into just getting some basic cutting going in the cut page of DaVinci Resolve 17. If you have any further questions, we can answer those now for you. Thanks very much indeed for watching. Cool. So there we go. I, it's a little bit of a whistle stop tour because there's lots that we can obviously do inside DaVinci Resolve and tons of tons of applications for different types of edits, depending on the type of thing that you're doing. But um, hopefully that was useful to you guys. You were able to take something away from it. Uh, we're going to share that recording with you guys afterwards as well from via a link. In fact, I'll pop it in the chat in just a second so that you can access it and, and have a good look at it in your own time and go through it again. But uh, yeah, that's um, anyone got any questions, I suppose? Um, yeah, I've got um, a question. Um, mm. I tried to use this program about a year ago and I didn't have much success. It kept, every time I fired it up, it said certain files were missing and certain things couldn't be found. Um, that was on a different computer. Um, I tried it again today. And again, when I, as soon as I try and open it, it says DaVinci Resolve could not find any open CL capable GPU. Um, and it didn't really give me any help of what I needed to do. I went on the, your forum and there were like loads of people with the same problem. Some had answers that worked and didn't work. And I just wondered is that... Um, Are you on a PC? I'm on a PC, Windows 10, mm -hmm. uh, i7 processor. Um, and what's the graphics card? Um, it's the built-in graphics card. So I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, 16 ram 16 gig ram yeah so that and 16 gig ram is is, is a is a the sort of minimum um spec for davinci resolve I mean, to be honest just in terms right. of system specs anyway um any video editing application does require 
a reasonable amount of power to run it. There are some programs which are a little bit lighter mm. uh, and things like, so I, I'm, I'm not, not any problem sharing it because I'd much rather you guys have an idea of uh, like using something that you like rather than you know having yeah. to use one or the other. The processes and the principles are pretty similar, um, but I know that some people get on better with Filmora X. Um, it's a web application, but it's, it's one that you have to pay for. So it's, you know, yeah. again, it's, okay, so this, is, this is free. The I know that the the graphics card can make a big difference. Um, can make a big difference when it comes to DaVinci Resolve, particularly. I had a client who was struck. He was actually getting DaVinci Resolve up, but every time I hit play, um, there was no video playing, and it was because he didn't realize that he had two GPUs in his machine, and he'd accidentally connected himself to the wrong one. So the problem was then that it was trying to use a, the, a GPU that was just underpowered and it just didn't have any any benefit. Um, the the message you're getting, I've not I've not come across before myself. You can set in DaVinci Resolve in the preferences, you can tell it which GPU you want it to use. And you can also tell it what type of graphics processing you want it to use. So for example, on a Mac, mm. I can tell it whether I want it to use CUDA or Metal or just see, find it out automatically for me. Um, obviously, with, if you're using an NVIDIA graphics card, it's definitely recommended that you use um, CUDA. And it might, it might be that the, the graphics card isn't up to, up to spec. If you, I mean, if you've got an opportunity to send me that across, just, just drop it across in an email. I'll have a look into it for you and see if I can find you a resolution to that. But yeah, it's not I mean, it, up before. It seems to be like you've got a user's forum. It seems to be a lot of people have got that problem. And there were some people having answers that worked for them and other people yeah. saying we tried that it didn't make any difference so i mean i don't know if it's it's not as i say it's not something i've come across before and certainly not something that uh for me i've i've, I've ever had someone com oh. sort of complain about i'm afraid so uh, apologies i can't give you a definitive answer on that one i, I definitely know as i say that setting the graphics card and, the, and on so much nowadays particularly so many video editing platforms run on the gpu primarily they still use cpu power for sure for certain tasks but when it comes to the way that graphics are handled and playback, it's so much of it's on the GPU. So it is important that you have the right GPU spec if you can. It's not, it's not crazy. It doesn't need a, a dramatic amount, in my opinion. It's, I think it's um, I think it's two gig is the minimum. If I'm two or four gig is the minimum. I think it's two gig. Pretty sure it's pretty underpowered. I mean, I've, we've, we've had it running on a pretty underpowered machine and it's been absolutely fine. But that was a Mac. And I'm, and I'm very much used to the Mac interface myself. So apologies. Uh, about that but let, let me have a look at your gpu send that across and I'll, I'll happily have a look into it for you i would advise that the forum is a great place <laughs> but it is a, 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 as all forums are mm. they you know take them with a bit of a pinch of salt because sometimes you get some people who are charging in there with great answers some people who aren't so i tend to watch for people who are either verified or part of the black magic staff um when they're giving sort of solutions to things uh, and then yeah and, and equally they do have a support page um, so it's worth speaking to the support team as well, because the support team are pretty darn helpful. And even they, again, they, the, the limit level of support they can provide you with as a free user is a bit lower than it would be if you were a studio user. Um, but having said that, most of them are pretty helpful. And if you can't get any joy through there, let me have a last and I'll see if I can find a solution for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sorry, you're having so much trouble with it. It's just a shame. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? I was just going to say it's lovely to meet someone who um, teaches as fast as I do. <laughs> no, that was really, really interesting. Thank you. I'm just on their website and I can't see the download for the free version to have a play so, with it. So normally it gives you a download, I think, and then it directs you down to the bottom of the page and it gives you the options of free or studio. And I, I don't, you're right. I don't think it's very helpful. If you go to blackmagicdesign.com forward slash support, mm -hmm that's the what that's where i go to get my downloads from i don't tend to go to the main page so again go to that page and you can filter by all the different products that they do but if you look for sort of davinci resolve you'll see that there'll be an update and you need to just download the what the latest beta for 17 so uh, in this case for the free users make sure you're downloading davinci resolve 17 beta 9 not studio because if you do that then you again you'll get in trouble there you go cars on the case yeah um, i'm quickly do a quick screen share Okay, jump in. So if you go to that link, just scroll down and you've got the download button right there. Okay. Does that, where does that actually take you, Carl? Because I've not pressed that one yet. Yeah, that's the, um, that was my, the main, where's, 
No, but does that download start off? Does that start the download for you? Or does it take you to a further page after that? Okay, perfect. There you go. That's okay. ideal. Yeah. So, you, so you got. I mean, uh, so you could still download the 16 version of Resolve. That's still the stable release as such. Um, but personally, I'd go straight onto the 17. I'm using. I'm. I've been using the 17 beta since. Well, since beta three, to be totally honest, professionally. Uh, I downloaded it straight away as soon as it comes out. One of the great things about DaVinci Resolve and Black Magic Design as a company is that they um, they're very they are generally very good with their their builds. They don't. I mean, I moved. I was Adobe Premiere Pro before that, and it just got fed up working on it professionally because it kept crashing numerous times, and it was just a nightmare to work with. So, um, and and if they ever released a beta, I wouldn't ever touch even think about touching it. But as I say, with them. Um, Black Magic Design and DaVinci Resolve, I've been able to work with, with beta releases. And they've been really good. Uh, they're probably about a month or so off the stable release for 17, but 16 works great as well. It's just there's some nice new features in 17. Okay, I think I missed something at the beginning. Um, you were talking about the differences between the paid version and the studio yep. version. Yeah, so so there there are definitely some pay. There's some, well, first of all, it's two hundred and thirty five pound difference, but um, for a piece of professional software, that's a really good investment from my point of view because it's also one at the moment anyway. It's a one time purchase, so you purchase it. I I first purchased it in oh gosh twelve point five I think, um, and I haven't paid for an update since. So it's 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 really they they they're a company that believes in you oh, know, not having elitist stuff getting in the way. Then and actually look at that through all their products. They have really affordable versions of bigger consoles and panels and grading systems and all sorts of stuff. And they want to make it affordable so that people have no barriers to entry, which is one of the reasons it's free. And they've said for a long time that we should be charging for the free version because it's so good. Um, yeah. The main difference is I did a video. I don't know if Carl's just linked it, actually. <laughs> linked yeah. it. <laughs> I've got a video on my YouTube channel currently, which talks about the, the sort of major difference, the main differences for me that I really like. The, the big one, from me, from a studio point of view, is you get the, the, the neural engine is different inside the, the, studio, the studio version. And that allows you to do all the clever stuff with the AI. So things like face tracking, um, not face tracking, but they, they do some open effects, which kind of track your face and make it easy to brighten your eyes, plump your lips and all that you know, digital makeup sort of stuff. So that's really powerful. It allows you to use dual GPUs as well. Uh, noise reduction is the big other one that people tend to get quite excited about. Um, obviously, if you do need to do noise reduction, you can do it in the free version. You'll just get watermarking across your image. And obviously, that's not ideal, but at least you can have a play with it. Um, again, for me, the noise reduction in itself was enough to pay 235 pounds for. That's that's the main thing. There's some performance improvements as well. Um, those those are the main things for me. And what you'll probably find out is that you'll go into the free version, and you'll you'll be. They don't tend to kind of completely limit you. It's not kind of like a you can't play with this until you've paid. It, they kind of let you play with it, and then. And then they say, well, really now, if you want to export it and use it, you need to kind of pay. Um, but it's, that, that's the main differences for me. Um, again, it's, it used to be 700 pounds, 800 pounds, something like that. So it was a lot more of an investment, but, but now they've reduced it. It's, it's kind of crazy. I would say get the free version and see how you go with that. Because for the most part, I, well, as I say, I, I've never, I hadn't come across in maybe three years of professional use that I ever needed to upgrade. And then I said, because I then became a, I became a trainer. I, I was doing more stuff professionally. I needed noise reduction, things like that, a dual GPU to work faster. And it was just an absolute no brainer for me to, to upgrade. And I don't know if it's, they're doing it at the moment still. I, you might need to double check on that. And, and they have got a delay, but they've got this amazing little panel. And I'm not, this isn't a sales pitch. This is me just saying, I really like this, but it's a great deal. At the moment, if you buy this panel, which is their speed editor panel, and it allows you to sort of jog through your controls and you've got, gives you some fingertip access. Um, it's 200 and, 235 pounds for the panel. If you buy the panel, you get DaVinci Resolve Studio for free. And likewise, if you buy DaVinci Resolve Studio, you get the panel free. Now, they, as I say, there's a bit of a delay on the panel at the minute because it was so popular. They thought, this won't be popular. And it was like, everyone was like, yes, and we're all ordering it at the same time. Um, so they had a bit of a backlog with the component part. But um, if, it's, if they're still doing it and you're considering buying the upgrade, do it and do it and get the bundle. Um, what you tend to have to do to do that is go to your particular supplier. DaVinci Resolve. Uh, so the way you buy DaVinci Resolve as well is a bit backwards. You can't buy it directly from their site. You have to go to, through a reseller. And then what the reseller does is he sends, they send you a nice little pamphlet, <laughs> which comes with your, your serial number inside here on a card and then a manual on the memory card. So it's, a, it's and then normally what happens is they have, they send it to you first. So you have to wait for it to arrive in the post before you can actually get access to the software. Um, but 
that's how you have to order it. And so what I would do is when you go to your manufacturer, whoever that, or your supplier, whoever that is Jigsaw 24 or CVP, I think in the UK, um, if you, if you can find the bundle, they'll probably be listing it as a bundle or speak to one of their support reps, then you'll get the speed editor DaVinci Resolve Studio bundle. I, it was a limited deal that they were doing at the end of last year. So I don't know if it's still available, but if you can get it and you're thinking about it, it's totally worth your money. It's like two for one. So. <laughs> yeah. So just one quick question. Did you do all of that on the free version just now, Alex, or did you? So you're right. No, that was the studio version just because that's the one I have installed in my office here. There was nothing there that you wouldn't be able to do right yourself right. nothing right. at all that was all you and, that, and that's kind of the reason i wanted to make sure it was very straightforward to use it we could have also done that as well and, and there's something i didn't probably explain clearly enough in there because of time the edit page and the cut page everything i'll get this right pretty much everything you can do in the cut page you can you can absolutely do in the edit page the cut page is just a bit more limited there are some things you can do and the, and the way that you work in the cut page is a bit different to the way that you work in the edit page and as i said you'll notice that rippling effect on the video one track that doesn't happen in the edit page when you do that and you cut something out it just leaves you a gap and you then have to close that up there's there are ways of doing it you there's a couple of keyboard shortcuts and there's a number of different ways almost everything you can either do from the top menu or from a right click contextual menu or a keyboard shortcut but they have a really great, um, I don't know if, I don't think Photoshop have it the same way until trying to relate it to photographers, but um, they've got a really great keyboard customization layout just in the, in the preferences. And you can basically see all the keys. If you're not sure what something does, you can find, search for that function and it will tell you what it's mapped to on the keyboard, or you can change your keyboard mapping, or you can again, click on a key and it will tell you what that key does. So if you're ever unsure, why well, press that button, what did it do? I find myself going to it constantly to remind myself what's, what keyboard buttons are, do, are doing what because they're, they're, they're all laid out. And again, we did a lot of mouse presses there. So a lot of left click, right click drag, because I think for a lot of people who are starting video editing, it's very easy. It's just easy to get you know handle around, right, I click and I drag and I click and I press this option rather than here's a keyboard shortcut for this, this and that. And you know, you're gonna be lost in keyboard shortcuts. But what you'll find is as you get better, and as you get faster, keep going to your keyboard will be a much faster way of moving through your footage which is why i still did the j k and l for play playback and stop and then the i and the o keys because if you look at your keyboard the i and the o keys are just above the j k and l and they're there for a reason because you can then just move up pressing in pressing out and then again you've got function keys to bring it down onto your keyboard so there's lots of ways they give you tons of different ways of doing one action and and, and that's true of you know photoshop and lots of other software but yeah every, everything that we did was in the was in the studio version but you should be able to do it in the free version uh, there's nothing that would stop you or trip you up there the edit page i would definitely have a play the just again on that workflow you've got the media page and all the pages listed on the bottom that's the desired workflow as well so media cut edit fusion color fairlight finish that's kind of your workflow so if you ever get stuck or what should I be doing next that kind of gives you an indicator as what you should be thinking of doing next possibly um and the the cut page really is a great place to start because it's simplified and it's easy but if at any point it's all frame accurate so let's say you've parked your playhead on a particular position and you want to jump into the edit page to do something that's a bit more complicated it's all exactly in the same place so every time you move forward it's going to always be exactly in the same place where you left it from a frame point of view so the great thing is you can park it on a spot jump forward do something and then jump back and they they very much want you to work that way they want you to work sort of in each room to do different things but you can stay in one room and do everything if you really wanted to but but the idea is that you jump out for more specific tasks and then jump back as you're as you're going through but again for me that i think the cut page you can do so much in by itself it's it's really powerful okay. anybody else got any more questions yeah alex just one quick question sure. um what tips would you have in in terms of filming something what should you do i mean in terms i mean i think is it cutaways and things you should have something that you Let's say you're yeah. talking about a frame or something like that. How, how do you ensure that you get a smooth? So, uh, well, yeah, so I mean, so filming techniques is a, is, is a, I suppose, a secondary conversation as well to agree. And I know Carl and Carlson was mentioning some things like audio claps and things like that. If you're using audio when you're recording on a mic and there's a lot of other technique there. Um, in terms of keeping things stable, I mean, I, we do a lot of, of stuff and we tell a lot of people to do things on their mobile phones these days because a lot of the mobile phones these days have built in stabilization anyway for you so that when you do something, it actually then stabilizes these shots for you. For the most part, um, I would always say as a tip, definitely shoot B-roll wherever you can. And for those 
if you, if you understand B-roll base, it's just additional supporting footage. So wherever you can, you know, if you're saying or you're talking about a particular thing, like Carl was talking about his frames in the studio, then shoot the frames, you know, get a shot of the frames looking nice. And sometimes it can just be a static frame, even if it's a still that you could just drop in over the top. It just helps because when you've got that B-roll to play with, you can then make cuts on your main narrative and then hide them by putting footage over the top or stills over the top. If you haven't got that footage, you're then left with either a jump cut, which is fine if you're on YouTube because they like jump cuts in YouTube. But as you said in the, in the example there, we had a jump cut. We didn't, I didn't fix it with um, a, a really cool transition they've got inside called smooth cut, which kind of morphs from one frame to the other, which can be really great at hiding like little uh, twitches or eye flicks if you've just removed an um and or ah. And so it's always, if someone's umming and ahhing and you've just taken that bit out and they're doing a straight talking head, you use this magic transition and it just blends them together. It's amazing. Um, but if you've got that jump cut, you might need to do like a little zoom like we did there just to kind of show someone like it's just almost a break in a scene. We've actually looked like we've zoomed in. Um, so I think shoot lots of B-roll. Wherever you can, if you're doing a talking head, or something like that, lock the tripod down, prop it up against something, make sure that it's stable wherever you possibly can, because it will just be more, more pleasing that way. Um, I, again, it, it's, it's so much like photography, well, it's a, it depends what you're trying to go for. Sometimes if you want like a walking vlog style shot, you don't want it to be completely locked down. You want someone to sort of feel like they're moving along with you, you're having that common conversation. So it's very much based on what you're trying to achieve. But in that situation, talking head, lock it down, keep it really simple. I mean, Carl actually had his was being handheld, I think. So it wasn't the most stable shot, but it was good enough for us for the time being. Uh, and daughter. There you go. See, so um, yeah, and then and then that other shot, we just applied a little bit of the stabilization post um, post filming, and and that sorted that problem out for us there. Uh, shooting as high a frame rate, oh sorry, higher resolution as you're possibly able to. That's another good one for me. Um, try not to shoot well wherever you can. Set up to shoot in the best the best resolution you possibly can, even if you're not thinking that you're gonna. So for example, 4K, shoot it in 4K, even if you're not planning to deliver in 4K. So if you're gonna go out to the web at 90, 1080p, shoot in the fast resolution, because then it will then give you the opportunity to reframe, refocus, reposition your canvas if you need it to. And equally, if you're doing any digital zoom or punch in, you can again do that without any degradation of quality. Or if you're doing stabilization, when it does that slight punch in, you've got some room to work with rather than if you're already at your limit and then you try and do that, it's just gonna start looking pretty jinky pretty quickly. Um, uh, audio is a big thing as well. Just make sure your audio source is as clean as possible wherever you can. So in a, in the scenario that we just had today, uh, I would definitely be using a different mic. I wouldn't be using your on-camera mic. It's not ideal unless you're in a sort of environment you can completely control. I would always try and get a little lav mic. Um, they, they do some great ones these days that plug straight into... There we go. Is that a Rode Go? Uh, okay, yeah, the Zoom one. Okay, perfect. So as either a Zoom um, or uh, yeah, Zoom do one, uh, Rode do one, a really clever one, a wire, which is called the Wireless Go. It's a little black box. It's actually got a built-in microphone already. I, I, I don't particularly like it because I think it looks a bit big, but some people use it. There you go, Zoom H1. Yeah, that fella. Plug a lav into that. And then, you, and, and then what you'll do there is you'd, you'd record your audio separately. You'd still need your scratch audio from your camera source so that you could then do that alignment that I told you about earlier. And, and as Carl said, a big clap at the beginning just gives you a, a, a lining up point for your waveform. So your waveform should then be bang on in line. And then in theory, everything should be in sync. Uh, I'm trying to remember in DaVinci Resolve, they do have an amazing feature uh, which auto syncs your waveform for you. So you haven't got to manually line it up. You just select the clips and hit auto and it just goes chunk and just lines everything up automatically. That I, I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head if that's a free version, uh, if that's a free feature as well or not. Um, yeah, and it, it is because you did use that last year. Okay, perfect. So, so there is there is some sort of auto syncing up opportunity. The key thing there is to make sure you've got a good waveform on on both cameras, so a decent audio level on both the, the camera and the and, and the recording device that you're using. Um, but I mean, they've the one that, the other one I mentioned. They actually feeds directly into your your phone. So if you wanted to, you could have it so that you're recording yourself with your phone, but the audio is coming from your lav mic, which is feeding directly in here wirelessly. That's the uh, Rode Wireless Go. It's about 140 pounds and totally worth of every penny. Uh, I, I've, I've got two or three now that I use on professional shoots and they, they're really good. So yeah, lots of B-roll, keep your camera stable when you can, shoot um, as big a resolution as you can and make sure your audio is good and clean. So that would work, that, that Rode Wireless Go would work with it if you're using a camera as well, presumably. 
yes, you need to buy a special cable. Um, the, so it comes with a, uh, it, so they, they do a cable called the SC7. So the Sierra Charlie 7, I think it is. Basically, uh, the connecting cable that they give you to begin with works brilliantly if, if you're going into a DSLR. But if you want to go into a, let me get this right. If you want to go into a mobile phone or a computer, you need a slightly different jack. Um, what I can do is I'll find, the, I'll find a link to the, I've got a kit that shows this in more detail. So I'll try and see if I send this across to you. But um, yeah, if you're going into a mobile phone, you may well need a different plug. And I think it's the SC7 cable. You've got a, it's got a gray end to it. But yeah, that, that system, uh, the cable's like 11 quid. It's not, it's not expensive. Um, but the wireless system can be adapted lots of different ways. We've um, just borrowed an old Rode mic or Zoom mic. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's a Rode mic, but one that can sit on the hot shoe of your camera and plug into yeah. the camera. So that presumably that would give better audio for, for initially trying it out. Yeah, abs absolutely. If you've got your DSLRs particularly, yeah, get yourself a little off-camera mic or sort of on-camera mic essentially, but the one that's separate to the it's the camera yeah, yeah. DSLR. It sits on the hot shoe. I think it's plug it into the jack. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Just be careful with your audio levels when you're doing that, because you can set your audio levels in your camera and, and depending on the, the, uh, the mic that you've got, you can actually change the audio levels on the mic. Wherever you can, you want to turn your camera audio down and your mic level up because that will help you because the, the preamp in the camera is not very good. The preamp in the mic is much better. Now, if you can't, if you don't have that feature, then obviously you're a bit stuck and you just have to set your camera audio, but you might find that you get a slightly noisier recording as a result, because the camera's trying to be the thing processing the audio for you. But for the most part, absolutely, it's, anything's better than the camera built-in mic on a DSLR for sure. Okay, I've, I'm, I'm, I've never really done moving image, so this is quite exciting and scary. And I've just downloaded Resolve, so we'll see. Brilliant. It, I mean, the, th the greatest thing is go out and try it. I think the, you know, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you from trying just a, even a little project. So right, I'm going to set myself a little project to do this and see. Uh, and, and the great thing is if, if you want confidence, look at YouTube. There's so many people out there making livings off YouTube, producing some absolutely horrible stuff. But yet they're just doing it because they, they're doing it because it's enjoyable. They do it because they love it. And actually, as we know, as business owners, I think particularly, it's so powerful for social media. Video content is by far and away the most engaged platform um so, so you know when you put up a video you get way more interest than you do from a photo sometimes and again you've got things like instagram stories and reels and all sorts of fun stuff to play with and it's all video based uh, so you know all the platforms are promoting video heavily uh, and again youtube is great it's free you know you can put content out there and people can see it and you can tag it and optimize it beautifully so that people who are looking for your services can find you and find interesting things that you're talking about uh, and so many people are utilizing it, and but uh, but masses of people are underutilizing it as a service. So, uh, yeah, great. Have some fun with it. So, just a question to Carl: the one you made for your gift vouchers is that on a free version? Then, yeah, yeah. So everything I've used is a free version. Um, what well, I just just to jump in there, I just share my screen just to show you back up what Alex said. You can see here this video of Dib. We've got six two thousand six hundred nine views, and that's not boosted. And it's just video content in your in your feed is everything. If you look at a um, this is one from Canva, four hundred three people, um, two hundred fifty eight. It's like a still image that moves a little bit. Um, but you can see that a photograph gets two hundred twenty two people reached without boosting. And video is 2006. And that's not boosted. And I've seen every time I do a video, the engagement is so much higher, which is why I want to take it more seriously. One of, one of the things I'd say as well is don't be afraid if you're, you know, in case of, oh, I've got to be on camera. You, you absolutely haven't got to be on camera. The great thing is you're the creative behind this thing. So you can have it, you can do, so, I mean, in we could just do graphics. You could just literally have a nice solid graphic with some text that comes in from one side. You can have a bit of music. That's a video. It's still a video. So don't feel, and you can, and you can narrate over the top of it if you want to. So don't feel, you know, stuck because you want to get, you don't need to get in front of the camera. Or you don't want to get in front of the camera. Don't let that be a barrier because um, really you're already getting, getting in your own way. Brilliant. Yeah. Other questions? Um, yes, I've got a question. Sorry, can I ask one more? Um, just 
said that you do training and things. So if I fell in love with video, which it's highly unlikely, but I might try, um, I have been dying to have a go at it actually. So um, tell me about how I'd find out about any more if I wanted to take it further. So, so well, for first of first of all, Black Magic actually, and I, and I, I, I have to say this because I think it's, it would be unfair of me not to, but they have some great free training on their website. If you go on the training, you see training, you can come down. They have a whole ream of training for DaVinci Resolve. Um, it's free. It's it's well done, um, and and I think that's a great place to start if you have a question or sort of little niggles or you just want to learn more generally. YouTube is full of stuff. Obviously, you can always come and look at my YouTube channel. Of course, it's growing steadily, which is lovely. So I'd love the support over there. Um, we're doing stuff about all sorts of things about Resolve. I'm trying to keep it quite simple and beginner level as well so that people can kind of get started. I, I think with trouble with YouTube is that you can spend hours searching for the right thing and not quite get the thing you're looking for. And you don't necessarily know the quality of the instructor or the person who's giving you the training and say so maybe showing you a way that's not actually conducive for you learning. Uh, and they tend to show you how to do something that you maybe don't actually need to know how to do. You just kind of watch it because it's interesting. And you go, oh, I might use that sometime. And you actually, it's not the thing you need to know or learn. So um, you can certainly reach out. Uh, as I say, I, I offer one-to-one -one training. I offer group coaching. And we're going to be running some online courses, hopefully very soon as well, which will be kind of low-level investment from people who just want to get sort of started. So, I mean, one-to-one -one training is, is certainly something we offer at the minute. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit less of it as we get busier, but um, for the time being, we could definitely do that. If you go to our website, which is depict.co.uk, there's a training on there. And actually, the only thing I think you can actually access at the minute is DaVinci Resolve one-to-one, -one, and you can just book a one-to-one directly with me from there and then the great thing about that is it's bespoke of course so if you're having specific problems we can sort of spend the time troubleshooting if we need to so you know if you need to look into that gpu situation we can absolutely look into that and see if we can find a resolution for that um, if it's just getting familiar with things if you want me to kind of watch along while you do something to see if you're doing it the right way it's just more bespoke it's up it's totally yeah. then you know i hope that you end up getting to the end result that you're needing to achieve faster mm -hmm. great and yeah so that's another way of reaching out and and certainly i'll be happy to help Fantastic. I've just put a link um, in the chat, which is basically a link to that video that we showed earlier. So if it was, I don't know if it was fuzzy or you couldn't follow along brilliantly, but hopefully that's a little bit clearer. So by all means, fill your boots and have fun with that. Um, if there's any questions resulting as, as again from today, um, by all means, just message me, uh, excuse me, um, info at depict or we're on um, any of the social medias as depict pretty much. So. I'll just share um, that link, Alex. So here's your out to the group. Yeah, so I was going to say, Carl's put your links in the group anyway, Alex, so people okay. will be able to find you, so that's Perfect. brilliant. Thank you. Um, any other questions, anybody? That was brilliant. Good, thank you. Then I just want to thank, on behalf of everybody and those that couldn't come today, Alex, because I know there were a few, I just want to thank you so much for making it achievable, I think. Um, I think people will look at that and think how achievable it was. The fact that we're not as handsome, as good looking as Carl, so going in front of something is another issue. But uh, maybe we'll get Carl to front everything for us. There's a thought. <laughs> no. I need, I need to, I need, he, he didn't look like he had time to clean his shirt quite. There was a few crumbs. I think he'd probably been enjoying a snack or something. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't decide, I, I decided not to digitally remove those for him. So. <laughs> thank you. Now, thank you. I really, really do appreciate your time, Alex. Welcome, welcome. Um, Lovely people. Yeah, it, it was really, really great. So uh, if nobody's got any questions, I'm going to stop the recording.